Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Val Smith, president of Swarthmore, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome all of you to the annual McCabe Lecture, a highlight of Garnet Weekend. In a few moments, two of our McCabe scholars will introduce you to this year's speaker. Now, this is the ninth time I've had the privilege of welcoming friends to the McCabe Lecture. Unlike my remarks in previous years, my comments this afternoon are suffused with a mixture of sadness and of gratitude as we remember and celebrate the life of an extraordinary alum, Rosamond, also known as Roz Stone Zander, class of 1964. Earlier this year, we invited Roz to be our 2023 McCabe speaker in an honor she graciously and enthusiastically accepted. She spent much of the summer crafting her presentation, and we were all so looking forward to welcoming her back to campus for this weekend. But unfortunately, Roz died tragically and unexpectedly in early September. So I'd just like us to take a few moments to remember her spirit and her legacy. In Roz's senior year uh, yearbook photo, we see the vibrant young woman, Rosamond Hopkins Stone, on the brink of a journey that would span the arts, activism, and the tireless pursuit of a more sustainable world. From Swarthmore to Bank Street, from Boston University to her roles as a coach, writer, therapist, painter, and ever curious explorer of life, Roz wore many hats, but her core essence remained the same. She was a beacon of optimism and possibility. Roz was a pioneer in the field of leadership development, and she created a model that inspired individuals to create a life of passion, vision, and contribution. In her books, The Art of Possibility and Pathways to Possibility, Roz's vision of positive change and growth come into sharp focus. A gifted plein air artist, Roz captured the beauty of the natural world around her. In a review of one of her exhibitions, um, the writer, the, a, a reviewer in uh, the Boston Globes wrote, and I quote, the artist knows how to subtly entice the eye into the composition via a winding path and how to balance terrain and sky, and a harmony between formal elements leads to successful pictorial elements. Yet Roz wasn't just an artist and a thinker. She took meaningful steps to protect the natural world she loved so deeply. Her significant work with former Vice President Al Gore's Climate Reality Project, her involvement in the partnership between United People Global and the Hurricane Island Center for Science and Leadership, and her significant support of 20 by 35, Swarthmore's plan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2035, all demonstrate her commitment to fostering a sustainable future. Given Raza's deep commitment to and passion for the natural world, we thought it only fitting to invite Elizabeth Drake Swarthmore's Director of Sustainability to deliver today's lecture. Elizabeth graciously agreed when I asked her to, to take on this responsibility. As you'll hear in a few moments, Elizabeth and Roz had the opportunity to meet on a couple of occasions. I was fortunate to be there when they last saw each other, and it was remarkable to see how quickly and easily they connected around their shared belief in the value of living purposefully and their commitment to environmental sustainability. So let us together remember Roz and her legacy of hope, resilience, and unyielding optimism. And let us continue to honor her by stewarding the earth she loved so deeply, by caring for one another, and by striving to live in a university, sorry, to live in a universe of possibility. And now I'd like to introduce you to two of our McCabe scholars, Zed Ali and Brandon Archer. Zed Ali is a junior at Swarthmore studying political science and religion on the pre-med track. 
This year, he's serving as the vice president of the McCabe Scholars. Born and raised in Houston, Texas, Zed is nationally recognized for his work on food insecurity and in politics. Besides his involvement with the McCabe Scholars, Zed is a news editor for the Phoenix, a Lang Center Associate for Public Health, and an intern for the, Children, the Children's Nutrition Research Center at the Baylor College of Medicine, researching the socio-ecological implications of hydroponic farms in urban food deserts. Brandon Archer is a junior with a special major in Black Studies and English Literature. He is both a McCabe Scholar and a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow. At Swarthmore, he serves as president of the McCabe Scholars, president of the Afro-American Student Society, a writing associate, and a research assistant focusing on the regression of student activist rights. He's been recognized nationally for his commitment to racial justice and community organizing from his co-founding of the Philadelphia Black Students Black Students Alliance and political campaigning to his appointment as executive director of Herb Ed Inc., an education policy and advocacy nonprofit. Please join me in welcoming Zed and Brandon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thomas B. McCabe Lecture at Garnet Weekend. Thomas B. McCabe, a graduate of Swarthmore's class of 1915, was chairman and CEO of Scott Paper Company, chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, and public governor of the New York Stock Exchange. He believed deeply in the value of education and was widely honored for his contributions to the field. During his lifetime, he received honorary doctoral degrees from 15 colleges and universities, including Swarthmore. President Harry S. Truman awarded him the Medal of Merit for his contributions to education, business, and government. Here at Swarthmore, McCabe's name, vision, foresight, and generosity endure. Generations of students have studied in the Thomas B. and Jeanette L. McCabe Library and enjoyed the serene beauty of the Scott Outdoor Amphitheater, gift from McCabe. To that end, he also established the McCabe Achievement Award Scholarship Fund in 1952, which has awarded scholarships to more than 300 Swarthmore students since then, many of them who are here today. The inaugural McCabe Lecture, established in Thomas McCabe's honor, was held in 1986. Since then, the lecture has reflected his commitment on education and his belief in young people's potential to make their mark on the world. It is our pleasure to introduce this year's McCabe speaker, Elizabeth Drake. Elizabeth is the Director of Sustainability at Swarthmore College, leading the Office of Sustainability's efforts to integrate sustainability into every aspect of the campus life, including teaching, learning, operations, and culture. In her role, Elizabeth envisions and implements sustainability initiatives to mitigate the college's environmental impact and to build awareness on the connections between sustainability and issues of social justice. A central piece of Elizabeth's work is supporting to zero by 35, the college's ambitious energy plan, which charts a transformative path to efficient, combustion-free energy on campus. Elizabeth also directs the President's Sustainability Research Fellowship, <clears throat> a high-impact, engaged scholarship program that equips students with the skills and knowledge to lead the change for sustainability. Elizabeth previously served as Climate Action Manager when she joined the Office of Sustainability in 2019. Prior to her time at Swarthmore College, she managed sustainability and regenerative development for Fetzer Vineyards, the largest B Corp certified wine company in the world. Her work focused on implementing forward thinking initiatives that meet waste, water, energy emissions, supply chain, and social impact goals in the pursuit of net positive operations. Elizabeth holds a Bachelor's of Science in, Environment, a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science and Sustainability from Cornell University a Certificate of Applied Sustainable Operations from Presedo Graduate School, and a Master's, of Studies from, a Master's of Environmental Studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Please join us in welcoming Elizabeth Drake to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I have to admit that I stand here today with mixed emotions. On one hand, I'm incredibly honored to be this year's McCabe speaker, and at the same time, I'm incredibly saddened by the circumstances that brought me here. When I learned that Roz accepted the invitation to be this year's McCabe speaker, I was excited. 
I had the privilege of meeting Roz a couple of times to sit and talk with her, and I know that her words here would have been meaningful and inspiring. As you've heard, Roz's interests spanned across an array of subjects, the arts, creativity, environmental sustainability, to name a few. Roz's interests and actions and her profound impact on the people and the world around her were bound by a common theme, the power of possibility. In her work as a family therapist and leadership coach, Roz embraced this notion of possibility, which she defined as an attitude or a mindset based in the recognition that life is a continual creation, an evolving complex system such that nothing about the future is determined. Roz authored and co-authored two books, The Art of Possibility and Pathways to Possibility, that challenge readers to tap into their limitless potential and envision a world filled with boundless possibility. My life's work is dedicated to the pursuit of sustainability, the possibility that humans and other life will flourish on Earth in harmony with the world around us in perpetuity. I grew up in rural central New York on an old dairy farm surrounded by woods and cornfields. As a kid, I was fascinated with the natural world around me. I had a journal where I would record my observations about different species of plants and animals. I had an old briefcase that I filled with dead dragonflies and other insect specimens that I found outside. Most of the property where my family lived had been cleared for farming in the 150 plus years since the farmhouse was originally built, but there was a stand of old hardwoods full of sugar maples tucked away in a back corner of the property. And my dad decided that he wanted to make maple syrup. Most people might start a hobby like that at a small scale, but he really went all in. He built a sugar shack, which you can see up on the screen here, and installed an evaporator, an elaborate system of tanks and hoses for collecting, storing, and reducing sap down into maple syrup. As kids, my brothers and I were tasked with emptying all of the sap buckets when they got full, those metal buckets that you can see attached to all of the maple trees. This meant that we were in for hours of trudging through the mud and the melting snow under the towering maples, pulling the buckets off the taps and emptying them into a cistern attached to the back of a tractor. By the end, we would have collected hundreds of gallons of sap ready to be boiled down into just a few gallons of syrup. For reference, it takes about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. And we were usually covered head to toe in sticky sap and mud by the end of the day. During those spring days in the woods, I really learned the rhythms of the land around me and came to understand the real world interactions between natural ecosystems and climate. The best days for collecting sap were sunny and above freezing following a cold night because sap only runs if the temperature is below freezing at night and then above freezing during the day, because it's those freeze-thaw cycles that generate pressure differentials within the xylem in the maple trees, resulting in the sap running. So if it was too warm or too cold, the sap wouldn't run. Today, maple syrup is an industry that's under threat from climate change, as the natural geographic range for sugar maples shifts north, warmer winter temperatures shorten the season, and pest and disease pressures strain tree health. As I grew up, my perspective and interests evolved from an ecological focus on nature to a deep concern about the ways in which humans are profoundly altering global systems, with grave consequences for the environment that I cared so much about and for all of life on this planet. I also began to understand the climate crisis as a crisis of environmental and social justice, as climate change exacerbates resource scarcity and conflicts and displaces vulnerable communities and those who have contributed the least to the problem are often the most impacted. Faced with this seemingly intractable problem at a scope and scale that can be completely overwhelming, Roz's teachings about possibility can serve as a powerful tool for living in an age when we are on the brink of climate collapse. Speaking of climate collapse, I would like to take a moment to reflect on the reality of the times that we are living in today. Earlier this year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, with the IPCC, or the International Expert Body on Climate, 
released a report finding that the world is likely to surpass our climate target of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit by the early 2030s, or 10 years from now. Scientists consider 1.5 degrees of warming as a key tipping point beyond which the chances of extreme climate impacts increase dramatically, which is why the Paris Agreement committed signatories to pursue our best efforts to hold warming below this threshold. Already, global temperatures have increased by over 1.1 degrees since pre-industrial times, resulting in measurable increases in floods, extreme heat, more intense hurricanes, and longer burning wildfires. The summer of 2023 was the Northern Hemisphere's hottest summer in recorded history. And just last month, September was considered, um, I think there's a scientist that called it gobsmackingly bananas, the temperature records that were set in September. In July, Phoenix, Arizona set a record 31-day streak of temperatures at or above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Devastating wildfires swept through Maui, while fires spanning millions of acres in Canada darkened the skies with dangerous levels of particulate matter right here in Swarthmore. Last summer in Pakistan, devastating floods submerged a third of the country, affecting 33 million people while extreme heat killed thousands in Europe, while drought conditions wreaked havoc on food and energy production. Current rates of species extinction are hundreds to thousands of times higher than the average rate over the past millions of years, and many scientists believe we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction event, this one caused entirely by human beings. I could go on. The climate crisis is unfolding in real time before our eyes. Yet global emissions continue to rise, and current efforts to reduce emissions are wildly insufficient to ward off climate catastrophe. Global greenhouse gas emissions reached a new high last year, as coal, oil, and gas continued to be the dominant energy sources around the globe. At times, it seems like our planet is on a fast track towards becoming uninhabitable. Joanna Macy, who is an environmental activist, author, and scholar of systems theory and deep ecology, quite powerfully captures the essence of these times. She says, I quote, all through human history, there was this tacit assumption that life would continue on this planet. There's always been wars and plagues and conflict and death, but beneath it all, there's always been an underlying assumption that life would continue and that the work of our hearts and hands would go on for future generations. That is what is lost now. And that loss of certainty for the ongoingness of human life is the pivotal psychological reality of our time. But she also says that this knife edge of uncertainty is where we come alive. She calls this time the great turning or the third revolution following the agricultural and industrial revolutions as a time of immense transformation in the story of human life on Earth. We, the people alive on this planet today, have the incredible opportunity to remake a world that is more just and sustainable for all. The possibility is immense. At Swarthmore, I oversee a program called the President Sustainability Research Fellowship, which is an engaged scholarship program that enables students to take stewardship over sustainability challenges in a year-long course and internship equipping them with the skills and experiences to become sustainability leaders. In collaboration with faculty and staff mentors, the fellows do things like develop a renewable energy strategy for the college, conduct ecological restoration in the crumb woods, and develop a system for recycling electronic waste. I shared this concept of the great turning and the opportunity that it provides with my students at the beginning of the year because my goal is for them to approach each of their projects with creativity and passion, embracing this opportunity to contribute to the remaking of the world. Recognizing the value in a program that teaches leadership skills while providing hands-on opportunities to participate in change-making, Roz generously supported this program in its early years, and for that, I'm so grateful. There are signs that we are on the precipice of this great turning that Joanna Macy talks about. 
Last summer, the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law, unleashing almost $400 billion for climate and energy in the form of tax incentives, grants, and other funding mechanisms intended to accelerate the transition to clean energy. The bill was the single largest action ever taken by Congress and the U.S. government to combat climate change and is expected to produce economy-wide emissions of roughly 40 percent below 2005 levels by 2035, essentially doubling our pace of emissions reductions and putting us closer on track to meeting our targets under the Paris Agreement. Prior to the IRA, this was entirely out of reach. This bill passed the Senate on August 7th, 2022, virtually guaranteeing its passage in the House and eventual signature by President Biden. That day, I was in the car with a friend on my way to Vermont for a surprise engagement party for another friend. And when I got the news alert about the bill passing the Senate, it actually brought me to tears. And I don't normally cry when Congress passes a reconciliation bill, but <laughs> for the first time in my adult life, it really felt like there was a possibility of change. I actually went back and found uh, my group chat with my friends from that day. Um, I had one friend who was a bit confused about the connection between climate change and the Irish Republican Army, um, but thankfully she's a little more up to speed now a year later. <laughs> And this isn't to say that the IRA is a perfect solution. It's far, far from it. The bill subsidizes the building of new pipelines, guarantees new leasing of oil and gas drilling, and incentivizes investment in carbon capture technology, which allows existing heavily polluting industries to continue operating with harmful impacts to frontline communities, often those of color who've borne the brunt of decades of pollution associated with fossil fuel infrastructure. We have a long way to go, but we can't overlook the significance of the United States passing a climate and energy bill at this level. In the years since then, companies have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in US-based clean energy projects like solar, wind, and batteries, and electric vehicle technology, and the US added over 100,000 clean energy jobs last year. A few weeks ago, during Climate Week in New York, the Biden administration announced the launch of the American Climate Corps, which is a workforce training and service program modeled after FDR's Depression-era Civilian Conservation Corps. This program will train more than 20,000 young people in the skills crucial to combating climate change, like installing solar panels, restoring coastal wetlands, and retrofitting homes to be more energy efficient. The idea of a climate core actually began with a progressive environmental activist group, including the youth-led Sunrise Movement, which has roots right here at Swarthmore. Activism, especially sustained over time, works. We're also seeing signs of transformation around the world. Last week, Brazil's Supreme Court voted against a proposal backed by agribusiness that would have stripped indigenous people of their land rights and eased the way for extractive industries like mining and agriculture on that land, a ruling that is expected to have a widespread impact on indigenous land rights in other cases. Protecting and expanding indigenous control of land is an imperative in and of itself, but it's also a climate solution. Indigenous peoples and local communities are among the most effective groups at conserving and sustainably managing the land and forests that they live in and depend on. Compared to areas managed by governments or private entities, their territories tend to be associated with lower rates of deforestation, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, better biodiversity protection, and improved livelihoods. In the Amazon basin, indigenous held lands have on average higher carbon density per hectare than non-indigenous areas, partly because their vegetation is in better condition. Climate winds are also happening at the scale of local governments. Two years ago, a county in Washington state became the first jurisdiction in the US to ban new fossil fuel infrastructure, following a years long battle over the impact of oil refineries and the local community, setting an example for other communities in the US and around the globe. This county hosts two of the state's five oil refineries, where much of the oil from Canada and Alaska is refined and distributed. This new ban on fossil fuel infrastructure, which also places restrictions on the expansion of existing facilities, is the culmination of a years-long fight by community members, environmental activists, and members of the Lumi Nation to resist a new coal export facility, pipelines, and oil train terminals, defying efforts by oil companies to elect industry-friendly candidates in local elections. 
This shift is also underway right here at Swarthmore. We're in the midst of implementing a transformative energy plan to zero by 35 that will eliminate our reliance on fossil fuels to heat, cool, and power our campus, helping us live into our commitment to achieve carbon neutrality no later than 2035. We're in the process of replacing our existing energy infrastructure with a geo-exchange system that will connect to almost all of our campus buildings. The Jew Exchange system will replace Swarthmore's high-pressure steam system, which was originally built in 1911 and relies on the combustion of fossil fuels, mostly natural gas, to function. Powered by renewable electricity, the process of geo exchange extracts heat from buildings during the summer and stores it underground for use in the winter, all while producing zero carbon emissions. Two central components of this system are the geo exchange plant and well field, a series of deep vertical holes that contain a network of closed loop pipes. As liquid travels through those pipes, it is either depositing thermal energy into the earth in the summer or extracting thermal energy from the earth in the winter. With the help of the central geo exchange plant, that liquid is then sent to individual buildings across campus where the HVAC systems transform it into heating and cooling. Over the past year, we finished drilling the first phase of wells on Mertz Lawn, 346 in total. So if you're wondering why Mertz Lawn looks the way Mertz Lawn looks, it's because we just drilled 346 800 foot deep holes in Mertz Lawn. And we're now in the process of laying all of the distribution piping to connect all of those wells before we fill it all back in and it'll look exactly like it did before. We're also building out the first phase of the geo exchange plant, which is located in the basement of the new dining center. The construction of this plant space was actually made possible by a generous gift from Roz Zander, who is excited about Swarthmore's commitment to climate action and by the synergies between the geo exchange plant and the new dining and community commons, which is being built to living building challenge pedal standards. Roz felt that this building, quote, had all of the elements to support a society-wide awakening as students would gather in a beautiful building that signals environmental stewardship. Higher education institutions like Swarthmore have the ability and the responsibility to model climate solutions and prepare our students to lead in a world that is already being reshaped by the climate crisis. We still have room to grow, but I'm grateful to Swarthmore for embracing this charge across operations, academics, and campus life. Beyond our energy plan, our campus is also a leader in the pursuit of zero waste, working to divert waste from incineration, reduce material flows through our campus, and challenge paradigms around waste and consumption. Faculty across disciplines incorporate sustainability into their curricula in disciplines ranging from psychology to theater to chemistry to biology. Our students are dedicated activists working with community partners in Chester and Philadelphia and beyond to advance environmental justice. Swarthmore also gives students opportunities to engage with climate policy and governance at the global scale. We've been sending an annual delegation of students to the United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP, since 2013. Last year, I had the privilege of attending COP27 in Egypt as part of the delegation, an incredible opportunity to get an inside look at how climate negotiations actually function on the ground. The summit was rightly criticized for failing to produce sufficient commitments to phase down fossil fuels, which is what we must do to prevent catastrophic warming, but produced meaningful change in other areas. Countries reached a breakthrough agreement to provide loss and damage funding for vulnerable communities hit hard by climate disasters. The first time that major emitters have taken any responsibility for the damage that climate change has inflicted on other nations with less historical culpability. This year, a group will be traveling to COP28 in Dubai at the end of November to observe negotiations about climate finance, loss and damage, adaptation, and more, while actively engaging with the thousands of other conference attendees from across the globe. This year's conference marks the conclusion of the first global stock take, which assesses the world's collective progress towards achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and provides guidance to governments on how to strengthen action and support global cooperation to address climate change. Despite the many flaws of the global climate regime, the Paris Agreement has actually been quite effective at mobilizing global action and increasing urgency around climate change. 
We've cut expected warming in half in less than 10 years, with some of the most catastrophic warming scenarios now quite unlikely. All of this to say, we have the solutions that we need. We can eliminate our reliance on fossil fuels by rapidly transitioning to renewable energy while investing in energy efficiency and electrification. We can embrace nature-based solutions like halting and reversing deforestation and ecosystem degradation. We can expand public transit and embrace development that isn't built around cars and switch to electrified transportation where we need to. And we can embrace a just transition that shares the benefits of a resilient zero carbon economy fairly and without replicating historical patterns of marginalization and oppression. We have the capacity to rapidly decarbonize and avert the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Project Drawdown, which is a leading resource for climate solutions rooted in robust scientific analysis, shows that the world can reach drawdown, or the point in time where the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start to decline, by mid-century if we make best use of all existing climate solutions that are available to us today. Last year, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who is a marine biologist, policy expert, co-founder of multiple nonprofits, and one of my personal climate heroes, delivered the commencement address at Middlebury College. In her speech, she said, to address the climate crisis, the all-encompassing challenge that will touch whatever life and work you will go on to, requires that we not just change or adapt, but that we transform society from extractive to regenerative. This is a monumental task, and it requires that we focus not on an endless analysis of the problem, but on summoning an expansive sense of possibility on harnessing our imaginations and our creativity. In The Art of Possibility, Roz and her co-author describe a series of practices or games for embracing this notion of possibility in our everyday lives. There's one practice that she calls, I am a contribution. Rather than focusing on what we can accomplish, particularly in comparison to others or against a standard of success or failure, Roz suggests that we instead reframe our thinking to focus on being a contribution. Each of us has the ability to ask ourselves, how will I be a contribution today? My climate hero, Dr. Johnson, has a tool for figuring out how we each might contribute to climate action, a Venn diagram that I like to share with students and anyone who asks me for advice about how to participate in climate action. First, think about what you're good at your skills, resources, networks, areas of expertise, and what you might bring to the table. Also consider what needs doing. Are there particular climate solutions that interest you? Maybe visit Project Drawdown's list of solutions and see what resonates. Lastly, what brings you joy, satisfaction, and energizes you to keep going? The intersection of these circles is where each of us can be a contribution. This model doesn't imply that climate change can be solved by individual actions like reducing our personal carbon footprints by going vegan or switching to renewable energy in our homes. The point is that we all as individuals can participate in systems change and that the collective impact of our efforts can be enough to avert the worst impacts of the climate crisis. In 2023, there is no career path or field of study or place on earth that is insulated from the climate crisis. Climate change isn't for students majoring in environmental studies or people working in sustainability. It's for all of us, and we can each find something at the middle of that Venn diagram. There's another practice from the art of possibility called the way things are. This practice challenges us to be present to the way things are, including our feelings about those circumstances. Being present with the way things are is not the same as accepting things as they are. It doesn't mean you should drown out negativity or try to transcend it. It simply means that being present without resistance frees us to turn to the question, what do we want to do from here? Opening up all kinds of possibilities. When it comes to the climate crisis, I think there are often two narratives that tend to dominate. We can choose to be optimistic that we can solve this challenge, leaning into positive progress and holding on to hope for a better future. Or we can look at the data about warming and fossil fuel consumption and believe that we're entirely screwed and it's too late. 
Personally, I firmly believe that you can find joy and fulfillment and meaningful action in this work and still believe that things aren't going to be okay. Every little bit of further warming that we can prevent has massive implications for millions of people, for ecosystems around the globe, and the future of life on this planet. Are things good? No. Can we stop them from getting worse? Absolutely. And this is where the idea of possibility holds so much power. Joanna Macy points out that there's no certainty in anything. There's no certainty that when you fall in love that you'll have a healthy, lasting relationship, or that when you plant seeds that you'll have a harvest. But we do it anyway, because of the possibility that these acts hold. Creating frameworks for possibility is the last practice that I'll mention, which is about creating visions and establishing environments where the force of possibility overcomes the pull of the downward spiral. In The Art of Possibility, the Xanders describe downward spiral talk as a resigned way of speaking that excludes possibility, creates an unassailable story about the limits of what is possible, and tells us compellingly how things are going from bad to worse. It's very easy to fall into this trap when thinking about the climate crisis for all of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. If you look at the data about warming and fossil fuel consumption, it looks like we're headed in the wrong direction fast. But we each have the ability to craft a vision for the future that orients our thinking and our actions in a different direction. Climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe talks about the role of hope in climate action in her book, Saving Us, advocating for a form of rational hope that accepts that success is not inevitable or even entirely probable, but provides a vision for a future that we want to live in, where energy is abundant to all, where we have the resources we need, and where our lives are not worse but better than they are today. Hope is something we have to actively practice rather than a feeling we wait for. Active hope involves taking a clear view of reality, identifying what we hope for, and taking steps to move ourselves or our situation in that direction. This isn't false hope, complacency, or misplaced optimism, but a recognition of the current state of the world, the way things are, and the courageous choice to accept things as they are and lean into the possibility of a better future. As students and families and members of the Swarthmore community, I think that everyone here must believe in the idea of possibility at some level. In a way, I think that's what higher education is all about. Swarthmore opens each of us up to possibility. It's our mission here to provide a transformative liberal arts education and empower all who share in our community to flourish and contribute to a better world. As the people alive on this planet today in this great time of uncertainty, where the future of life on Earth is at stake, it's our collective responsibility, our moral duty, to work towards a more just and sustainable future. As Roz might say, we have the power to be relentless architects of possibility and remake the world and create a brighter, better future for all. Thank you. All right, so now I know we have a few minutes for Q&A, and I believe there's some mics that are going to be floating around in the audience if anyone has any questions. Or maybe you're all too deep in thought about how you're going to engage in meaningful climate action. Oh, yeah, I see one down here and then one up there. Hello. Hi. Thank you for that very engaging lecture. We really enjoyed that. So there's a narrative going on regarding the cost prohibitive nature of uh, going green, right? And so, you know, you, you know, you spoke about the impact within our communities um, of folks who are really challenged from a resource standpoint and how, as individuals, we can all play a part in this and not be overwhelmed by the narrative of trying to essentially boil an ocean, right? There's so many components we can really take on in this. But, you know, what are your thoughts on the narrative about us going green being so cost prohibitive that folks may or may not be able to kind of make their individual contributions in this. And so I'm just curious of your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for raising that. Um, I think I have a couple thoughts. I think, like you pointed out, I don't think the burden of solving the climate crisis should rest on individuals and communities, particularly those that have kind of borne the brunt of the impacts of climate crisis. Um, I think we're starting to see policy changes like the Inflation Reduction Act make things like renewable energy, electric vehicles, energy efficiency improvements, those kinds of things more economically accessible to a broad range of people, which is a critical component of climate action. Um, I read a, a study the other day that projected that the Inflation Reduction Act and all of its um, incentives should actually lower the average cost of energy for the ha average household in America by about 112 dollars per year. So I think there's these policy incentives that are coming along to try to address that challenge. I also think there are a lot of ways to engage in meaningful climate action that um, aren't about, you know, making energy improvements in your home or switching to electric vehicles, that are more about, you know, getting involved in community activism or um, political campaigns or other efforts. Personally, I think one of the, the biggest impacts that we all um, can have on the climate crisis is through voting and civic engagement. Because um, you know we see policies like the Inflation Reduction Act that have the capacity to um, pretty dramatically alter the landscape for clean energy in the United States um, at the federal level. And we don't get policies like that if we're not putting candidates in office that believe in the climate crisis and the urgency of it. So I think there's also a, a tremendous amount of impact that can be had through efforts like that with getting involved in local communities and activism um, in civic engagement rather than some of those more cost prohibitive ways of you know, lowering your individual carbon footprint. Um, so I'm, I'm a McCabe scholar from 1981 to 86 and I now work at the National Academy of Science directing a board on environmental change in society. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask you for some advice. Uh, we uh, are setting up a climate resilience pathway, climate resilient communities pathway. And you know, part of it is mitigation, which you focused on, and part of it is adaptation, and both are, are necessary for resilience. So at the community level, how do you think we need to best promote resilience? So we're dealing with the mitigation aspects as well as the adaptation aspects. It yeah. sounds like you're doing some of it here, which is wonderful. Uh, but do you, do you feel like there's some general lessons that can be drawn? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, as we saw by some of the statistics that I showed today, you know, we're past the point of preventing climate change and its impacts around the globe. We're, we're seeing that now. And that's where adaptation and resilience is equally as important as trying to prevent future warming because we, we live in a world now where we can't ignore the very present impacts of the climate crisis. Um, you know, just last week in New York City, we, we saw what that looks like and how millions and millions of people are being affected on a daily basis by the impacts that we see here. Um, I think climate resiliency at the local community level starts with understanding how climate change is projected to impact your community, because it's something that's so individual. It might be flooding, it might be droughts, it might be heat waves, it might be winter storms. It can take any number of forms that I think are very specific to the community based on location, but also the existing community infrastructure and what already exists to meet the needs of that community under strain from climate change. There's some communities that are much better positioned to, to adapt than others. And so understanding kind of what those impacts are for your community and what already exists to address them, I think is step one. And then being able to um, build in solutions depending on what those pressures might be. Um, you know, for, for cities where heat, extreme heat is going to be a big problem. Um, you know, increasing green space, having uh, cooling shelters um, and different things like that will be the right solution for that community versus, a, you know, a community where catastrophic flooding is the problem will require infrastructure changes, um, emergency alert systems and things like that to help that community adapt to climate change. So I think for me, it really starts with understanding what the specific needs of that community are are to then be able to build capacity um, with community organizations and service providers and local governments to be able to respond and provide resources in response to those pressures from climate change that all of us are going to experience over the coming decades. 
Yeah, Val. Elizabeth, thank you so much for such a powerful and inspiring speech. Uh, so I, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the politicization of this issue that can lead to um, denial in the face of what would seem to many of us to be incontrovertible evidence of the climate crisis. Uh, what do you see as the possibilities for speaking across ideological differences mm -hmm. to uh, sort of open up a shared sense of possibility for bringing about um, meaningful responses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of thoughts come to mind. Um, I referenced Catherine Hayhoe, who's a, a prominent climate scientist who wrote a book called Saving Us a couple of years ago that was all about the topic of um, kind of communicating across differences to pursue meaningful climate action. And something she talks about in her book is the fact that climate change has a connection to something that resonates with everyone. Regardless of what your political ideology is, there's probably something you care about that is under threat from climate change. Like maybe you like skiing or hunting or whatever it might be, climate change has an impact on the things that you care about, your grandchildren, your family, whatever it might be. Um, and so being able to kind of skirt the, the political issue of climate change and instead talk to people and connect with them about the ways in which climate change, and you don't have to call it climate change, you know, will impact those things that people care deeply about, enables you to, to connect with people in a different way, rather than trying to convince someone to care about climate change, which is an abstract issue that they're probably not going to care about. And as soon as you, you know, call it climate change and start talking about climate solutions, I think it inherently brings up the politicization of the issue, but kind of um, instead focusing on what people already care about and drawing those connections can have a lot more of an impact. Um, there's also research um, from the Yale School of Communication, uh, something called, I think it's called the Six Americas with regards to climate change. Climate change is Six Americas or something like that, where they look at data over time um, of the US population and how people feel about climate change. And there's maybe five or so um, different categories that they drop people into. You know, very concerned about climate change, kind of concerned, neutral, not really worried about it, or completely in denial about the problem that exists. And the number of people that actually are climate deniers in 2023 is a very small portion of the population in the United States. And so, you know, Catherine Hayhoe points this out in her book as well, don't really worry about those people. You know, we don't need 100% of people on board to create meaningful change about climate. We need a majority. And if you look at the number of people that are very concerned or kind of concerned or at least receptive to being concerned about climate change, you already have a majority. Um, it's not to say that anyone should be left out of climate solutions, but a lot of times trying to convince someone that doesn't see climate change as a problem or doesn't believe in the fundamentals of it, that's not where you're gonna have an impact. So instead focusing your efforts around individuals who might be receptive in some way to climate change is a better kind of use of your energy when pursuing meaningful action. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was interested in what you said about this idea that everyone cares about something and most people care about their own backyard in some meaningful way. How do you think we can harness that uh, sort of intrinsic value that we place on the things that are immediately around us to and sort of harness that and use it to build out broader solutions? Do you think it's possible? How, how does that work to, in your mind? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think a good example maybe is um, in agriculture. You know, I think small farmers um, in the United States and around the world are um, their livelihoods are very much under threat from climate change as droughts and extreme weather really undermine um, their living and something that they might have a significant cultural attachment to as well. A lot of times, um, you know, farming communities in the United States might also be kind of in that category of resistant to climate change, kind of victim to the politicization of the issue and not necessarily receptive to climate action as sort of a, a political stance. Um, 
But I think there, there's a lot of case studies and research out there showing that if you can connect with those, those groups around drought impacts and what that means for their crops and their harvest, um, and talking about climate resilience and how local policy solutions and even broader policy solutions can help address the issue that is causing that impact that they're seeing in their everyday life. I think that's where you can make those connections um, with sort of um, connecting solutions to the very present issues that folks are already looking for solutions to and being able to sort of scale that up um, to, to bring people along on this journey of climate action. And I think it's something that's very situation dependent and being able to understand what are the issues for different stakeholder groups? You know, what do people care about? And being able to meet people where they're at, um, I think is really the key to being able to um, bring people along on the, the journey to climate action. Following on that thread, beyond educating um, people who contribute to the common good, is there a role higher education can play in that direct change that goes beyond research and writing papers? Yeah. Um, so I think um, there's a couple of roles that I see higher education playing in climate action. Um, one, there's a lot we can do on our own campuses here through decarbonization and things like the energy plan to zero by 35 that we have here at Swarthmore. And to zero by 35 has a huge impact here on our campus, but you know, Swarthmore College is just a tiny little drop in the bucket of global greenhouse gas emissions. You know, whether or not we're carbon neutral doesn't actually have that much of an impact in the grand scheme of things, but where we have an impact is how we can model solutions for others. Um, for example, with our energy plan, we get so many calls and emails from other colleges and universities, organizations in pharmaceuticals and various other industries who want to know how we're transitioning to geo exchange and eliminating fossil fuel combustion on our campus. And we're in a position where we can bring people to campus and we can show them and we can tell them how we're doing it. Um, we're also at the forefront of being able to leverage IRA incentives for our geo exchange transition. Um, we just kind of lucked out with the timing, honestly, <laughs> that when the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, we were already, you know, starting the implementation of this plan. And so we're um, kind of one of the, the first schools or entities that's able to leverage some of those tax incentives um, for our project. And so we have tons of people asking us, you know, how are you using IRA money for this? How do you meet all the requirements of the federal government to be able to get the incentives and that kind of thing. So that's where I think higher education institutions can really set an example and share learnings from our individual experiences with other entities and kind of spread that impact beyond the boundary of our own campus, um, which I think is our overarching goal. It's not just to make Swarthmore more sustainable, it's to serve as a catalyst for change beyond our own campus. I also think that, you know, higher education institutions can have such an impact in the ethos that we leave our students with when they leave their four years at college. Um, you know, it's my personal goal for every single student that graduates from Swarthmore College to have an understanding of how the climate crisis intersects with their chosen field of study and their life. Because like I said, there's, there's nothing you can do in 2023 that won't be impacted by climate change in some way, shape, or form. So every student should leave college with an understanding of that and to be able to take that with them into whatever it is that they do after Swarthmore. Um, in the, the President's Sustainability Research Fellowship Program that I direct, a lot of the students that, that come into that program aren't necessarily environmental studies majors, and I like that. You know, they're math or political science or history, biology, chemistry, whatever it might be. And that excites me because it makes me think that, you know, this student is going to go off and do something totally unrelated to sustainability, but they're going to understand the importance of the climate crisis, the importance of sustainability, and bring that with them into whatever it is that they do after Swarthmore. And that's where we can also have such a big impact. It's not that everyone has to go be a sustainability professional, but if we can help our students understand the magnitude of this issue and the individual responsibility and agency that they have to make a difference, I think that's where we can have such an incredible impact around the world, both you know, by what we're doing here on campus and by what our students take with them when they leave. All right, we have time for one more question. 
Thank you again for the talk. Could you just give us an example of either current or recent uh, PSERF projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I see one of our PSERFs actually right here in the front of the audience. We've got Jake down here. Um, so I'm actually mentoring the project that Jake is working on, um, which is in collaboration with the Swarthmore Borough Environmental Advisory Council. Um, so that his project is actually focused on off-campus impact. Um, Right now, um, in sort of the, the policy landscape, there's a ton of money, grant money, and different types of funding out there for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, trying to expand that network of infrastructure and enable um, the transition to electrified transportation. So Jake's project is actually working with stakeholders in the borough of Swarthmore to identify funding opportunities and gather information to be able to apply for grants to install more electric vehicle charging infrastructure in the borough of Swarthmore. Um, so that's one example of a project that we have going on right now. I also referenced a project earlier um, about developing a renewable energy procurement strategy for the college, um, which I think is one of the potentially the most impactful projects we've had. We had a, had a student um, quite a few years ago who the whole purpose behind this project was helping us figure out how can we get enough renewable energy to power Swarthmore with renewable energy. Um, and there's all kinds of different ways that you can do that with on-site renewables, off-site renewables, different contract structures and whatnot. And he helped us um, kind of figure out what the right model of renewable energy procurement was for us, um, which is something that I'm still working on now, you know, building off of the research that he did, we're pursuing an off-site um, power purchase agreement to be able to buy enough renewable electricity for our campus. And I actually, um, when I'm preparing materials for the board or for other stakeholders, I actually go back and reference the memos <laughs> that this student wrote a couple years ago about, you know, how does this kind of thing work? Why is this the right solution for Swarthmore College? Um, so I think there's a lot of really cool kind of long-term impacts that we've been able to see um, from those projects. Great, and I think that we are out of time for questions. Um, so thank you all so much for being here, it was a pleasure.